Okay, hi. Hi. This, um, welcome everybody to uh, a conversation. I have not thought of a clever name for this yet, but um, today I'm Isaac Collins, the pastor at Wesley Memorial in Charlottesville, and I'm joined by a longtime friend, Antonia Terrazas. Uh, Antonia, introduce yourself to the folks. Yeah, you actually nailed the pronunciation of my name also, so <laughs> props to you. Um, yeah, hi, so I um, went to seminary with Isaac and um, I, at Duke Divinity School. Um, I'm originally from uh, Texas and also sort of New Mexico, currently based out of, out of North Carolina. Um, I um, grew up in um, sort of charismatic, Pentecostal, Baptist light churches. <laughs> and um, in college, found my way through some uh, progressive Baptist churches, kind of made these different pit stops along the way out of um, a more fundamentalist way of thinking, if you will, and, um, and found myself in the Episcopal Church. So kind of all over the place uh, when it comes to my spiritual autobiography. Um, and kind of that's how I found my way into seminary as well. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, that I think that not to make like generalizations, but I feel like complicated spiritual autobiographies are like deeply millennial. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. That's fair, especially if you like if you stick with it in any way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Eventually, you're like, right. how did I end up here? Well, it was about eight churches ago. Right, <laughs> right, right. It's There's like a like a Candyland game or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, with like the, you know, what is wow. the thing? The molasses pit. That's yeah. You're like, well, what does it mean to be saved? You get like stuck in the. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> And not move Be there forward. forever. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, Antonia, uh, can you do the Baylor thing just for everybody? Can you no, do I'm not doing a sick I'm not doing a sick bear. That's the hard way. That's the hard way. Yeah. <laughs> um, I wanted you to join us today because um, I think a lot of people our age. Uh, who grew up in sort of an evangelical environment in Christianity um, get into adult life and become sexually active and, and carry a lot of baggage with them about the way that uh, church in their early life, you know, centered control over the body uh, mm -hmm. and centered, you know, a sort of normative sexual practice and, um, maybe they find when they've moved on from that and into a new place like you did with the Episcopal Church that they're not quite sure what to make of all that and that even that they're like sort of holding on to some of those aspects. So I wanted to have you on to talk about like just very basically what is purity culture and um, you know it, it, probably we're going to decide that it's a nebulous thing but um, <laughs> but I'd love to hear you talk about some of the stuff that um, some of the ways you've thought about this and some of the work you've been doing since divinity school uh mm -hmm. thinking about this topic yeah just a small little question <laughs> to start us off just we've about. got the 30 seconds on this <laughs> yeah, right um yeah i mean purity culture you know just to to have the starting place is um the sort of world around um sex and sexuality typically within um the evangelical church but definitely not limited to that um and in which you know writers church leaders thought leaders whatever you want to call them thought, um, leaders. thought leaders yeah the word the worst um, oh, I just had a good pun, T-H-O-T. -T. Yeah, I was thinking about that, okay, too. Yeah. Good. Good. <laughs> we're, we're on the same page. Good. <laughs> uh, it's I'm my bio now. <laughs> yes. They, um, yeah, just the, a framework in which, you know, 
typically sex is reserved for marriage between a man and a woman. Um, there are lots of, um, also just lots of rules imposed around what a healthy sexuality looks like. Um, and usually that um, involves both like the physical, um, you know, actions and also the inner thought life of individuals. And it's also like, incredibly gendered so the um the expectations around sexuality sexual thoughts sexual activity <laughs> are um very much determined by um you know whatever gender role you're growing up in in the church yeah can um, we just pause right there and sort of yeah. dig into that because i think yeah. you're absolutely right so i think that um if you're hearing the words purity culture for the first time, um, you may need some like other things to help you mm -hmm. see, think about what it is. So if you ever went to like a silver ring thing, event, yep. Yep. or you uh, took a pledge to save yourself for marriage and you wore a silver ring or something like that, um, yep. you know, God wants you to stay pure before marriage um, or, you know, some other things are like, even as simple as like, you know, if somebody may have sat boys and girls down in, in your church or at, even sometimes at school, God forbid, mm -hmm. and said, you know, here's a, this shoe represents your body, specifically yep. in many ways, the female body. Yep. And, you know, this shoe is, is your vagina. And if you have sex, then it'll get worn down. Um, oh, that's a good one. I haven't heard that one before. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. They'll pull out like a nasty Nike and be like, Oh my God. This is your vagina after multiple partners. And do you want your like husband to wear this shoe for the rest of his life? Wow. That, yeah. I mean, I've heard so many different, um, yeah, metaphors. I mean, there's like, uh, bubble gum that's been like chewed up by multiple people or like over chewed or whatever there's one for my personal like purity culture book was called and the bride wore white by dana gresh wait wait who by who dana dana gresh hold on it's over here oh it's actually written by a woman oh a lot of them are written by women okay like it's a real self-hating world out here <laughs> Um, it's not great. Um, but she, she talks about it in terms of like, what would you rather serve to your like guests? Like, would you rather serve like your finest china, a diner mug, or like a styrofoam cup that's disposable? I've also heard of, um, one where they like put people in a row with a cup of water and yep. tell you to spit in it. And then they're like the last person. They're like, do you want to drink all these people spit? Because that's what your husband's going to have to do. Great. When you all have sex for the first time if you don't save yourself for marriage. So Great. all of this is about specifically preserving, um, you know, women's bodies for the, enjoy the enjoyment of their uh, soulmate. Yeah, right. Right. Um, but and I think that's that like that affects that ripple effect affects so many so many things like obviously it's very gendered obviously very heterosexual um has a lot to do with what women's body what and who women's bodies are for um yeah even down to like a, like attraction and attractiveness there's a lot to unpack there yeah i mean say a little bit more about that because i think even I mean, it, on some level, do you think that all of this is about, um, I mean, to me, I think there's an element, sort of like two sides of a coin and in, in purity culture around what it wants to do, which is sort of constantly have sex on people's minds, mm -hmm. but in a very controlled way. And how are some of the ways you've seen that play out and expectations for, you know, teens or young girls in church or even, you know, in ministry right yeah um there is just a an expectation of hyper vigilance around keeping oneself pure and one's 
you know, mind, thoughts, and actions, pure, um, whatever that means. And pure is also a really amorphous, changing category. Um, and some, you know, some like youth group leaders or authors will say, you know, well, it really, what really matters most is what's going on in your heart. So, you know, if you masturbate, then that's okay, as long as you somehow manage to not think about anybody, which might be achievable for some people, but, <laughs> you know, not always. And um, yeah, so I mean, I think what I'm getting at is that it's, it's a confusing category. Um, it's very um, difficult to maintain or pin down. Um, and which is, first of all, not helpful to anybody. <laughs> um, yeah, and um, I think definitely it um, it sets up a lot of just expectations that aren't achievable for um, men or women. Um, and I have now lost my train of thought. Yeah, but, I mean, I liked what you said about... Um you know, that it kind of creates this internal monologue, right? It's something that right. someone can, like a, a person who, a mentor of the faith, a pastor, a youth leader can sort of present you with this really intense image. But the power of purity culture, I think, is mm -hmm. that it stays with you in your mm -hmm. own interior life. Right. Um, have you experienced that? And and like, especially in high school or college, mm -hmm. um, what did that look like for you? You know, how did it, because it's not like it's always, it's not like, I mean, it is very present in evangelical Christianity and in other types mm -hmm. too, but it's not, but I feel like in some ways, what they want to do is make you the kind of, make people the burden, the, the ones who are carrying the burden of constantly being in that hypervigilance. Right. Yeah, definitely. Um. Yeah, I mean, in high school, I did go to a private Christian school, so um, these conversations were had, like, within the eight to three hour of education, so this is part of my education as well, um, which is wild, <laughs> if you think about it. Um, yeah, just definitely lots of, um, lots of lessons about, um, you know, what kind of what we were talking about before women's bodies being um you know not being expendable but being something that it's that is usable um that can be used up um and i think i'm sure that i mean i know that men and and boys that i was in were in school with um had similar battles or different ones um but for me it was um it also intersected with um, just messages about the body overall and um, and like fat phobia within the church. And I, in the, um, I mean, obviously this is very particular to me, but um, I was in a Dallas mega church that definitely prized like excellence um, and being like your best for the Lord, which intersects with this purity idea mm. as well, like doing, doing your best so that you can be acceptable. Um, and that extended to what your body should look like and what your, um, yeah, just being in good, um, in good shape, whatever that means. And um, making sure that you look the best and are presentable and, and all of those things. And, um, one way that that shook out for me was um, when we were having these purity talks with the um, youth pastor or, um, you know, our school chaplain or whatever. Um, it would be a conversation about, um, you know, if you, if you wait for marriage, I mean, it's very prosperity gospel. Like if you wait for marriage to have sex, then you will have um, a, your sex will be, amazing and mind-blowing and definitely no problems after you've like suppressed your sexuality your entire life <laughs> and, <laughs> um and also you know i like 
you know, I, Mr. Youth Group man waited for sex and look at the smoking hot wife trophy that i um that like i was gifted after all of these you know god, god came through in a big way right yeah oh, sorry. <laughs> i put my computer in and um yeah it was always like it was very much i mean at least in the circle that i was in there was also this sense of like great reward for waiting um and which is so damaging for so many reasons um again that you know it just like warps what sex should be or should look like or whatever much like other things in our culture do but um with a like just fun religious spin on it and also definitely put certain types of bodies and people on a pedestal. So, um, so, you know, for me that translated to, well, I better like try to be somebody worth waiting for. Mm. Right. Like I better like try to shrink my body to look like the pastor's wife Mm. or to, um, you know, make myself, um, like a worthy prize by the end of this yeah okay so so heavy (laughs) there's so much there to to dig into but i i want to ask let me me plug my computer in real quick very important nice so this is who i am as a person here we go i thought i plugged it in and i definitely did not cool yeah so Tell us, give us a little more context around uh, women, old, older women in the churches that you grew up in. Do, you know, were they allowed to be um, ministers? What what function did they serve? Kind of digging into what you just said. Yeah, um, my um, in my context, which is uh, kind of North Texas um, evangelical charismatic megachurch land. <laughs> is um it was really unique actually because um i think because of the emphasis on the holy spirit there was this sense and this is true i think in a lot of pentecostal contexts there is a sense that um the spirit falls where the spirit falls and so women were allowed to um preach and teach um and i think they were called pastors but you almost always they were pat hey on a second sorry there's a, a person um Mowing their grass lawn. right next to the window Great. Great. <laughs> pause <laughs> <laughs> incredible timing okay sorry always uh, always yeah well they, these women were like always uh wives of pastors and i would love to see i'm like did they get paid like how did that look um i'm guessing no yeah i don't know i mean or yes because money was also extremely mm, warped um in this world so you know whatever funnels more money into a, a single family is good um but yeah so in some ways women were um you know were leaders in my world um but then obviously you know there were definite power imbalances and like what they could and couldn't do like they could speak to women and at women's conferences and i think sometimes on sunday morning but often not um and then also even though a lot of times women were doing the same jobs in the church as men to some you know to some extent there were still um lots of conversations about spiritual authority and who should be the head you know in the house um i remember going to a wedding not long after i graduated from that school um i was in college and i was going to a wedding of one of my classmates uh from that time and the person officiating uh was a man um and he was you know marrying these two people who were um both professionals like one was a teacher one was in finance or something i don't know and like um 
I was listening to his sermon and he's just talking about how, you know, um, you're, you know, to the bride, like you, your job is to support your husband and his career and to be his, um, to be there for him and, and make sure that his home is well maintained and all of these things. And I'm, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking like, she also works, you know, just as much as her husband does. And also efficient person, like your wife is like a badass preacher lady who works. And I'm like, how does that, it doesn't even, it's just unintelligible. Like it doesn't make sense for the words that are coming out of your mouth. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's so much. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that definitely we should get into scripture and the role it plays in um, in a second. But I want to go back to something you said about the connection between purity culture and like the prosperity gospel, because mm -hmm. I think that it, it hit me when you said that, that that's kind of how the prosperity or the, that's kind of how purity culture, like, it's meant to sort of create this nuclear family that then goes into this hyper successful sort of, you know, consumerist life. And, you know, man, woman, two kids, picket fence, um, you know, like, so, you know, I think that, and all of this kind of has this notion above it of like Jeremiah 29 or something, but it's like mm -hmm. once God gives you that, you know, trophy wife or that, you know, knight in shining armor, um, then y'all have to like get productive, you know, have kids, make mm -hmm. money. Um, and and it, there's the, like that expectation of purity kind of exchanges itself for like an expectation of success. Right. Um, yeah. So anything that. Well, and purity is a form of success, right? And there, and, and that, in that mindset also. Do you think there's that expectation then that if you don't stay pure, that God will like somehow change their, change their mind about the soulmate? You know, is that part of the success? Ooh, I don't know. I don't like, I don't know if the logic extends that far to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, because that would imply that God could change God's mind. Right. And so I think it's, I think it's dicey. Um, I think that there. I think it's more of a like the the language that I heard a lot more was like if you step out of outside of God's will, then like God's best for you like won't be available to you. Mm. Um, and that's true in so many different areas of this of this world. Um, but yeah, if you um, and I don't know if that changes who the soulmate is or if it like sort of has a butterfly effect thing of like okay if you like you know, cut off um, certain options to you, then, you know, this is what you're left with. But that was also in God's will because God knows everything, but it wasn't God's best. Well, I, this is making me think of like psychotic <laughs> skits I used to see where like as soon as, you know, the person has sex, suddenly they're like doing drugs and then going to commit suicide yep. and then right. end up in hell. Exactly. So that I think it's more like you get off the track and you get, mm -hmm. you get lost yeah. And then there is, you know, no saving you unless you somehow find Jesus again. And so it's like, right. but, it, but that link between, I mean, in all of those skits, it really does go straight from like, oh, you had a beer once to like, and now you're killing yourself. <laughs> right. Right. Well, like, it's very, um, uh, the, the scripture that was weaponized a lot was like, just about I mean, I guess a few different scriptures about like the fruits of the spirit or um, a tree producing good fruit. Mm. Um, and so, I mean, to me that also, um, in my world, that also translated to um, like the rigidity of heterosexuality <laughs> because, um, you know, look at all these problems like the gays have. I mean, this is a whole other train of thought, but like, look at all these problems that um that homosexuals have and it's because their tree doesn't produce good fruit um and like you know and this is still pervasive um like you know the lgbtq community like has higher rates of depression or suicide or whatever else and it's like i think one way of narrating that is like oh because of their identities or their lifestyles or whatever um 
this is what that lifestyle produces. And instead, instead of, it really took me a long time. I mean, like through seminary to unpack that and be like, oh, actually that might be more about like a world in which, you know, the world's response to those identities, um, yeah, creates some, some structural and like mental health issues. Like if living in a world that doesn't affirm um, or celebrate, you know, a person for who they are, whatever that means or looks like, um, of course that's damaging. And so of course there's more of a likelihood for, you know, for like depression or anxiety or whatever, whatever the case may be. Um, so anyways, all of that kind of, kind of goes back to, um, this idea of how the fruits of one's life, um, are because of the choices that you have made, which is very prosperity. That's all language of prosperity gospel. Right. That individual responsibility. Ultimately, if you don't have that life that God wants for you, because God wants that life for everyone, then it's because of your, you know, it's your fault. It's not mm -hmm. because of structural inequality. It's not because of injustice. You know, Dave Ramsey, mm -hmm. um, thinks, you know, writes in his book that it's impossible to be poor because of injustice in the United States because God has chosen the United States because we're the most um, biblically, like, established society in the world. And so if you mess it up and find yourself with credit card debt or student loan debt, it's your fault. You right. spend, and that's why you're in debt. It's not about oh, injustice in our society because God has decided that this is the most just country on earth. So right. um, again, it goes back to like, you know, these powers that if you give into them, and I think this is the same thing for young, for like teens in, um, and actually in a weird way, this, I mean, we can kind of talk about how men are kind of brought into this, but this notion that, you know, if, uh, ultimately, if if a teenager has sex, like if, if you have premarital sex, well, then you've given in and messed up. And this is actually part of a really another element of all this, right? Is that women's sexuality is extremely controlled. It's all about looking good. That you know, grooming yourself to be that perfect wife, mm -hmm. um, ready to satisfy your husband. So they want you to be like you know, a nun and a porn star at the same right. time. Right, exactly. Yeah. Uh, but then on the other side of that, men's sexuality is uncontrollable. And right. it's Wild like... Wild heart, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like, you know, uh, if somehow premarital sex does happen or an affair happens, it's the woman's fault mm -hmm. because men just can't help themselves. God has... Right made right. them to have sex and you know it's it's up to the women not to tantalize right. them so right. we get into like or to, just, or to stop them right okay. but also to please them so it's very <laughs> it's very confusing yeah um yeah. yeah i mean i mean what the sort of an unspoken uh, another buzzword uh, to bring in is modesty modesty culture um which is what you're describing um that you know it's on it's the woman's responsibility to not be a quote-unquote stumbling block or a temptation for um men to partake in one way or the other um whether in action or in thought or whatever the case may be um yeah so this gets back to you know how you dress from everything from that to you know. How you behave, whether you come to youth group with sh with wet hair, because then that might like make the boys think about you showering, and so you should definitely come only with dry hair to youth group <laughs> because that's a new one for me. I've never. <laughs> yeah, no, that was yeah. That's like not unique either. Like I, that's like mul like multiple. Um, and like how, like measuring how thick your like tank top should be or how short your shorts should be or how deep your, <laughs> your v-neck should be. Um, 
yeah it's a very um it's it can be an all all consuming self yeah self uh policing kind of way to be um yeah because it does i think what you were saying earlier is really important that it does like get get into your into your own psyche so that you are your own you know judge and um you know you're just that self-vigilance is is really is really damaging and i think different people respond to it differently like i um was very much a rule follower so a lot of my story is about the fact that i did not um that i was the good christian girl in all of this i think some people have a different story in that they were not able to um to keep those very high standards or to perform in the way that their churches wanted them to and so their stories are different and more about um the consequences of what that looks like to not um you know to not abide by those rules um so it's very you know it is very tailor fit to the person as well and i will say uh, one thing that i was thinking about earlier is that um while purity culture is not just a thing that exists in white churches, I, you know, I think it's important to, um, to point out that a lot of this stuff is just different depending on the culture and race of your community. Um, the church I went to in high school was very, very mixed um, in terms of demographics, both racially and economically and whatever. Um, but I hear, I just, it's just worth flagging that I hear different kinds of stories, um, depending on what kind of church you went to. Yeah, and I think that a lot of that, you know, um, I mean, a lot of this has larger sort of political realities in, in America and, and some that have definitely, you know, entered into the highest levels of power right now. We've got Mike Pence who refuses to be alone in a, in a room with another woman without his wife present. Right. Um, who he yeah, calls the Billy Chicago. Graham rule. The Billy Graham rule. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Oh, know. I've been Billy Graham ruled a few, a few times. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that, um, you know, I think that all of this, again, I, I think that, there are a couple of things that I just kind of want to flag here because I think it's something that maybe people who are coming from that background can struggle with is that it becomes such a focus of your spiritual practice, whether that's journaling, whether it's praying, whether it's like um, the context for even salvific moments or experiences of grace in people's lives. Like, oh, I failed to be sexually pure, but God forgave me. Or like, I... Um, you know, got saved at like one of these events or even just like the way I talk to God has mm -hmm. been fundamentally shaped by, you know, either apologizing for, um, yeah. you know, feeling sexual attraction or, or masturbating like you talked about or even having premarital sex or something like that to, you know, where you're always putting yourself in a place where you're like, okay, I've disappointed you once again, God, and now I'm coming back to ask for forgiveness or whatever that and i think that that can you know it can make it difficult to kind of step out of those things and step out of that way of thinking about your body so can, can yep. you share some of how you know what helped you recognize and sort of deconstruct some of this stuff yeah um hmm there's so many threads, it's really hard to, to unravel all of them. Um, I think for me, one, there are a few things that were really important for me. One was um, really processing all of these things in community. Um, I had a group of friends in seminary who um, were committed to just talking through sexuality whether that means like i mean both from just our experiences and unpacking the stuff together um and committing to kind of unraveling these threads 
Um, and it was really helpful to hear um, perspectives from people that were outside of what I grew up in um, and realizing, oh, like not everybody thinks about this the same way. Like there's not one way to think about sex or, cause I think another part of uh, what I grew up with was there is one way to be Christian and then everything else. <laughs> um, like, yeah, even down to the point of like the mainliners, like not even really being truly Christian. And so, um, it's just, sorry, very... Methodist. <laughs> bye. Um, you've been, been kidding yourself. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, so even just, you know, it's a very, it's a very small way of thinking. And so even just exposing myself to friends who, um, were raised differently around some of these things. Um, also, you know, I think a lot of it ran parallel with undoing um, my beliefs around um, sexuality and homosexuality, queerness, all of that, which is a whole other conversation. <laughs> but for me, um, that really unpacking what virginity looks like or what it means or doesn't mean without even knowing to call, to phrase that as virginity as a construct. And mm. um, so I think, you know, just starting with processing my beliefs around um, homosexuality and then thinking about, wait a second, so if, if like two ladies have set, you know, just like getting down to the like embarrassing mechanics of some of these things. I mean, like, wait, so if they're vir not virgins, but they are, but they're not, <laughs> you know, and kind of, and actually like going backwards and realizing, oh wait, so then that means that um, maybe some of the things that I've thought about what losing your virginity or remaining pure, it kind of starts to unravel a little bit um so those are kind of some of the starting points for me in thinking about um you know just kind of realizing oh wait the emperor really doesn't have any clothes like this doesn't make sense <laughs> yeah i mean i think that uh i've certainly known uh i mean there is some of that within the community already right like where it's like uh, people are who want to have sex are like, okay, how can I have sex but uh -huh. not lose my virginity? Right. <laughs> so right. Oh, like... yeah. <laughs> so many stories about doing everything but, and it's like, wait, everything but what? Like, what do you, um, you know, lots of folks were having sex but not really knowing it was sex, basically. <laughs> yeah. Then. Right. I mean, but it's, you know, it, so it comes back to what you said earlier about purity culture being you know, uh, sort of the foundation of it is this notion of, you know, a penis going into a vagina and like that type, that being intercourse, that being the kind of sex that God has said, this is good, but only at the right time. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and, and I think that honestly, when people try to come out of this, they think that like, okay, well, I've been told this thing is like, totally off limits but like still good eventually but um then when they experience it inside of a relationship or not mm -hmm. it's not that simple mainly because um like you said their view of sexuality is so limited to mm -hmm. that one type of experience so like right and know, also because like sex is weird and bodies are weird and everybody brings their own stuff to it right it's not no matter what it's you know it's weird and messy and great like <laughs> you know um and so bringing a lot of those expectations um anyway kind of messes things up yeah yeah um i mean i think that i don't think that people are ever really given the opportunity to think about sex as something that they need to um experiment with or or just kind of accept the same level of vulnerability and awkwardness in that you might experience in conversation or right. you know how do how do we do this and 
And or it's what, something you're learning, right? right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, rather than something. Or as, that as something doing. that you're working out within a relationship, like in the same way that people have to learn how to argue or learn how to, <laughs> you know, um, yeah, do just about anything else. Um, yeah. yeah, and I think ultimately it, even something that thinking about it is something that like um, where grace can be operative too, right? Where instead of, um, and because ultimately that's what it takes is what we're saying is that sex is something that requires inter an exchange of grace between people in some mm -hmm. way. Well, that was, that was the thing that I left out earlier um, about what were some of the things that helped me shift my perspective on unpacking was um uh which it's not it's not a perfect um document by any means but um the body's grace by rowan williams um in that um, i think it was originally a speech but in that um short essay it's probably 10 pages <laughs> and the the main takeaway is that um you know we think of uh we can think of sex as um, something that fulfills certain purposes um, and is um, very, you know, either for procreation or for, um, you know, only supposed to be within certain bounds and, you know, all of these kinds of things. And his, um, his sort of thesis is that, um, is basically that, that sex can be a like sacramental way of interacting with each other and can be um a means of grace so to speak and the a way of experiencing um yeah something holy which is not to say that holy has to it has to be set apart but something that is a gift yeah. um and that um is a gift that can be um, it's not just a one-time thing. <laughs> yeah, and I think just for enjoyment, right? I mean, right, I think right. that that's... And pleasure is a gift. Right. And desire and all of those things, right? Yeah, and I think that that's something that ultimately, um, you know, when you get down to it, it's just kind of absent from all of this, is that there's such delayed gratification in this purity culture mindset, in that prosperity culture mindset that, you know, even when we're not working, probably a lot of people are, um, are struggling with, like, if I'm not, you know, at some point down the future, even the whole sort of vision of evangelical Christianity is that your reward awaits you after you've died. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and then until then, uh, we're constantly in danger of falling, you know, of losing that reward, right. um, rather than seeing, uh life and all of its like weird aspects as elements of um the creativity of of god the creativity of human beings and of the world and i mean i think a lot of this you know it's it's always impossible to pull apart christianity from the culture and politics that it inhabits but mm -hmm. i think this is a you know, in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic right now, it, it kind of makes all these things easier to see how intertwined they are. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we, we barely allow ourselves to function outside of the realm of work. And our entire day is spent with, you know, where we feel the need to accomplish something. So if we're feeling that way, just about our jobs, like, mm -hmm. how easy is it going to be to disentangle all of those pressures from like the act of having sex and like, just mm -hmm. trying to think about hey, we're doing this to enjoy it and for like no other reason. And like mm -hmm. taking time to do that is okay. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's not about also this being productive and in, in right. another way. Right, right. <laughs> I say that ha after, you know, having a baby two months ago. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, so lots of jokes about coronavirus babies going around, but. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, Antonia, can you talk just to kind of put a pin in this or to kind of cap off this discussion? Because there's definitely a lot here. But oh, yeah, there's so can, you much talk, <laughs> can you talk some about Holy Blacked Out and what that is and yeah. your inspiration for doing it? 
Yeah, so I, um, so Holy Blacked Out is my, um, I guess, project of um, answering, unpacking, disrupting some of these messages that I um, was raised with and a lot of us were raised with. Um, so it started with um, me doing some of this deconstruction um, of kind of everything that we've been talking about and also just the worldview that I was raised with within evangelical Christianity more broadly. And um, again, in conversations with folks in seminary who weren't raised the way I was, I'm like, man, I'm describing some of this stuff and it sounds a little off base. Like, <laughs> did, I, did I, did I really experience, you know, are these things that I'm remembering, like, are they really real? So I had to, I, it started by me ordering a, um, a Bible textbook from my, um, from my high school days. And, um, and just to like, I think it was two cents on Amazon plus shipping. And so I was like, okay, like I had to do some archeology span to be like, is this, is this really like as bad as I remember? And the answer is yes, it is very bad. Um, this particular textbook was called Understanding the Times. It was an apologetics te textbook um, in which you know, you're invited to learn about all these other non-biblical worldviews. Wow, amazing. And, um, and unpack, you know, what's wrong about them and why biblical Christianity is, um, you know, superior. I had the expanded edition in, in high school that um, included, <laughs> included the uh, worldview of Islam. <laughs> oh, just in time for 9-11. Oh, was it right after 9-11? I think, I don't know when it was published, but yeah, I'm sure, you know, there's so much of that rhetoric was really kicking and Oof. like, yeah, even years, years afterwards. Um, so I, you know, I had been introduced to what's called blackout poetry or found poetry in a class in, in seminary um, where you use a text that, um, you know, just any given text, like sometimes it's a newspaper, sometimes it's, you know, um, yeah, an encyclopedia or some, you know, something kind of banal and everyday. And you use words that are from that text and um, kind of like uh, magnetic fridge poetry, <laughs> almost like you take what's given to you and do something new with it. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, it's a good metaphor. Right. Right, yeah. Um, and so I started to do that um, with this text that, um, you know, that was very anti-science, that was very, um, you know, just a one way of thinking, um, and started to write a new, um, find an alternate message within the words that were given. Um, so I, um, I found, I kind of used that same, that same, uh, process of finding words on the tech, on the page and linking them in a new way to create a different message. Um, and there's a lot of metaphors I think about, uh, in terms of this work, which is like, you know, separating wheat from chaff and searching for mm. Egyptian gold and, um, you know, turning swords into plowshares. <laughs> yeah. um, and so a lot of times, um, and so from there it expanded to, um, to texts that were more along the lines of purity culture and, um, you know, and non-affirming theology, things like that. Um, and a lot of times, the goal is to create a piece that that is against the message of whatever is on the page. Um, mm -hmm. So if it's a text about, you know, who women should be for their husbands and they should speak or um, be leaders or have thoughts and minds of their own or, you know, whatever the case may be, a lot of times, you know, the the message is something something that goes uh, directly against it. I was trying to see if my 
Um, I have, I now have a whole shelf. I'll show it to you since we can, since we're. Oh my I, God, you have a whole shelf of books. Oh my God, it's, it's probably the most well-organized shelf in my whole collection. So <laughs> there's like, you know, a whole shelf of um, like Josh Harris is a, a classic. Um, Lady in Waiting. Movie. Yeah, right. Oh man, that Lady in Waiting and um, what's it called? Created to Be His Help me. This is like full of actually abusive, abusive stuff. Um, like if you're, you know, if your husband is angry with you and does X, Y, and Z abusive things, then you still shouldn't leave him because he's your husband and God said so. <laughs> it's, it's bad news. Um, yeah, like a lot of the goal is to um, is to directly combat those messages. Um, yeah, and I th- I think it's worth pointing out that this is what um, I mean, it's not like this is a small segment of Christianity. You know, the evangelical world is now basically the second largest uh, type of Christianity in America besides the Roman Catholic Church. Um, so for people who are from Wesley who are watching this, there are 6 million United Methodists in the United States, you know, another six or seven globally. to, And that doesn't even scratch the surface of the evangelical world. So I think that... Uh, even if this is the first time you're hearing about this named in this way, you've mm-hmm. probably experienced it. Mm-hmm. Um, but even if you haven't, uh, there are people who have, like, this has been their entire experience of who God is, is through this right. lens. Right. Um, wow. So I, I feel like Antonio, there are a couple of things that, I mean, I, you know, we talked about doing this again and I think if it's okay with you, I'd like to invite people to maybe send us some questions for you yeah. uh, to respond to when, so that just to see what this brings up for people and, um, yeah, for and then sure. we can jump back in and kind of just see where, what people need to hear, but also tell people where to find Holy Blacked Out online. Yeah. Um, I, well, and as I'm, I promised you that I would give a resource list as well. <laughs> um, oh so yeah. I, and resources yeah. for purity culture stuff yes please yeah do. yeah so there um yeah there's a lot of a lot of good resources for for folks to even if they just want to understand this world a little bit more um yes yeah, so you can find the probably the best way to find it is um on instagram that's where most of the most of the action happens so it's um at holy blacked out on instagram um so even if you don't have instagram you can do instagram.com slash holy black dot which is h-o-l-y-b-l-a-c-k-a-e-d-o-u-t <laughs> i'll put a link in the video yeah. description right yeah so um can follow along i'm hoping that uh quarantine will um <laughs> give me a chance to to make some more um and it's good to check out visually because it's kind of hard to hard to grasp when you're just describing it so yeah. sure what are some <laughs> of the resources that you've cobbled together um yeah so i think a few um so diana anderson wrote a book called damaged goods um she's also mm-hmm. a good friend um and uh, also went to baylor so that's kind of fun um there's <laughs> we're all we're all trying to cope one way or another um Ugh. There's a book called um, Good Christian Sex by Bromley McClendon, I think. I'm going to be mad if I get that wrong. Um, And then Linda K. Klein's book is more recent. It's called Pure, um, kind of unpacking. um, Yeah, unpacking the the phenomenon and the movement itself. And she also has a... um, an interview on NPR somewhere um, that would be good to find. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot. Um, and so I'm happy to send you some links that might be, and especially since getting books right now might be a little complicated, I'll, I'll try to do my best to find some things that are more accessible at home and online. Awesome, yeah. I was just, I was just thinking that um, this world is so multifaceted that we didn't even talk about like purity balls and stuff like that. Oh my gosh, yes, yeah, or like, <laughs> purity rings pure yeah uh purity contracts um and you're also like making this agreement like with your dad yeah with your dad yeah. 
he's the one who like uh has a say yeah it's all your yeah your body is and your choices are always uh in subject to whatever the man in your life is thinks or feels about it yeah i mean i think on some level the the crazy thing about it is that there's so much ritual associated with this kind of thing that i think it's in that's maybe one of the hardest things for people to um to recognize when they're trying to deconstruct these things is that it's been um you know even weddings in a lot of ways are connected to things about purity culture that kind of go unnamed but are very powerful and you know we sort of alluded to in in that uh title of the book that you said bride the what bri- every bride and the bride wore white and the bride wore white yeah so i think that um and we didn't even in, get into one of m- sort of my most pernicious interaction with purity culture which is john eldridge's wild at heart yep oh, <laughs> oh. man the whole idea of which is that every woman needs to be saved by a man right. and uh you know you just got to find your princess and then go rescue her I mean, which gets back to that notion about salvation and christianity and what god is doing when you do get off the path you know and anyway it's uh it's a wild world out there folks yeah <laughs> yeah it's an interesting yeah and i th- i think i um there's so much to continue um, deconstructing even as you leave this world. Like I didn't, um, you know, I had done a version of, you know, deconstructed up to a certain point and then I like entered a serious relationship and I was like, oh, I have like all these expectations around like partnership and like, um, you know, how, yeah, how this, how this should all go or look like that I, didn't realize was still lurking around like rattling around back there so it's a lifelong journey is what I'm getting (laughs) getting at absolutely and if this is the first time you're hearing about all this um and it you know it it may surprise you to feel defensive about some of the things you've heard Mm -hmm. um and that's okay and I think that it's something that like takes a while to process I mean I know for Antonia and I seminary was only the beginning of stuff that we've kind of been unlearning and and relearning or anything like that so I think that uh if this brings up a complicated set of emotions for you like just be affirmed that that's probably uh I don't want to say normal but it's expected (laughs) Mm -hmm. that's kind of part of the process yeah 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 okay well Antonia um is there anything else you want to plug your Instagram, other things like that, where people can find you? Oh, your um, pod, you've done some podcasting. Yeah. Um, if you want to, um, you can, sounds dumb, but you can just like search my name on Apple podcasts and, oh, wow. um, yeah. <laughs> which is more to say, which has more to do with the search engine on Apple podcast getting better than, <laughs> than anything else. Um, but I've done, I've, uh, talked a little bit on um the lord have mercy podcast and the tiny revolution podcast so yeah and and you're also a a big enneagram person there are definitely some people who are going to watch this who love the enneagram too so um (laughs) maybe that'll come up in it if you have questions about the enneagram for (laughs) yeah sure throw those out too (laughs) what's your number just oh i'm a four wing three yeah (laughs) Strong. strong in both of those lots of feelings lots of performance i don't know like yeah (laughs) awesome well thank you so much for doing this it's been a lot of fun yeah thanks isaac yeah